Good afternoon. Welcome to the Cyclo for Entrepreneurs, a 10 session program that addresses all aspects of entrepreneurship. I take this opportunity to extend a cordial greeting to all those who are joining for the first time and especially to those who are seeing this cycle for, from different parts of the world. As you know, the Cycle for Entrepreneurs is an initiative promoted by the Alumni Association, a new project of the school that offers five large areas of service to students and alumni in training and knowledge, professional development, networking, benefits and discounts. Final challenge, investment, elevator pitch and exit is the 10th model of the cycle and will focus on how to present the company to investors, the pitch deck or corporate presentation, the executive summary and different ways to sell the startup. We will also include several internali internalization techniques applying lean startup and customer development. To talk about this topic, we have the presence of Alvaro Cuesta. Mm -hmm. Hello. He's the founder of Sonar Ventures, the first <coughs> Spanish startup producer. It's a company that is dedicated to advise a company and launch new projects of proven success in the international field. Alvaro is also a consultant and expositor in different companies and institutions in topics of digital strategy and entrepreneurship. Also, he was president of the Young Entrepreneurs Association of Madrid and the Young Council CIIM. Before giving the word to Alvaro, I invite you to participate in this session and ask your questions to Twitter using the hashtag that appears on your screens. Again, welcome and enjoy. Thank you very much and uh, thank you to all of you uh, that are listening in the, in, the, in the live session and also in the, uh, the non-live sessions and YouTube and other channels that uh, you can actually see this. Uh, before I, uh, I get to the specifics of uh, today's uh, workshop, uh, as you know, I'd like to, to summarize uh, all the uh, topics that we've seen before and contextualize uh, this session in the, in the whole program. And I think actually today is the last session. Uh, so it's, it's also good to, to finalize. Uh, basically, this has been a, a workshop, a program on how to, how to be successful entrepreneurs. And you know my concept and, and my idea, I mean, those of you that have been following uh, previous uh, workshops about success. Success is not just uh, uh, making a lot of money, a lot of profit, which of course is, uh, is uh, nice to have, uh, but also is just doing it for the right purpose, with the right people, with the right methodology, having fun along the way, even, even though it's a terrible uh, and very uh, tough um, experience at the same time and very harsh. But at the same time, it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's very much worth it. So to me, that's, that's successful entrepreneurship. And we've been covering all the aspects. Just to, very, to, to, quick, uh, to, to make a quick review, we've seen the, the, the golden circle, the, how important it is to start a company with a purpose. Actually, I think it was uh, last week that I, I was reading one, one sentence, one quote from Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche, he said, uh, he who has a why uh, always finds the what. And actually, it resonated me a lot because it has a lot to do with this modern approach of the why, how, what, this golden circle. To start with a, the right why and then go for the, uh, to the who and then go for the, for the what. And, and, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can see it uh, in Nietzsche's words or uh, in uh, Simon Sinek's words that is actually the one that created this golden circle approach. And... Either way, it's always good to have the right purpose. It will give you much more uh, endurance, more perseverance, and more energy, more fuel when, you, when things get rough and, and you need to, to move on. So that, that was the golden circle. Then we, understood, we, we learned about and we discussed about the customer discovery and customer development approaches, the, the how, and how, what are the different methodologies to accomplish and, and to start uh, a, a, a start a company. And at the same time, we covered um, the who, the, the team, and not just the team, but also, I mean, the team started from us. Uh, we uh, covered different aspects about what are the traits and the skill set that you need as, a, as an entrepreneur in order to, uh, to make the, the project successful and also in order to recruit and, and, and motivate the right team. And so we've seen the different profiles, the different archetypes, was in the hacker, the hustler, and also the hipster. That was the third subtype. Uh, that was more like a sensitive, product-oriented, aesthetics-oriented, instead of sales or operations 
oriented. And how important it was to know about ourselves, to do an introspection, to, uh, an introspection, to know what are our strengths and weaknesses, and then to look for people that actually are complementary to us and start the company from there. We've seen also the culture, how important that team and, and the methodology and the different traits and the different values and the purpose and all those uh, aspects, how it configured the culture of the company and how important it is. Remember, we've, we've seen a full session on um, on the importance of uh, culture, comp uh, company culture. Uh, remembering also this book that it was called uh, Culture Eats Strategy for Breakfast, which uh, from Peter Drucker. That actually, uh, that sentence to me is like a very, uh, uh, very well synthesize uh, the message uh, that you know we we try to to convene. So we've seen the culture, we've seen the operations, how important the operations were in a startup. Of course, in every company, operations are important, but in a startup, uh, a common mistake uh, a common mistake is to think about operations once you're growing, uh, to, but you, sometimes we forget how important it is to consider scalability in our uh, somehow in our, in our DNA of the company and our culture and that's why some companies that actually grow uh, a lot in a very short period of time that's what it's called scalability um, they're not prepared for it so sometimes it's the lack of clients and sometimes it's the lack of scalability that's why operations should be embedded into the company's culture and processes so operations culture um, Lean startup, customer discovery, customer development, all these methodologies were very important in order to launch the right product. We've seen the whole product um, roadmap, how important it was to start from something that we, we named, well, actually it was not my, uh, my call, it was uh, Eric Ries' uh, call, the minimum viable product, the MVP. And that was the some, somehow the, the embryo of, uh, of a product, which is not actually a product itself. It's still an experiment that we run in order to validate our main hypothesis. You remember this lean startup approach that was based on the scientific method on, you know, frame a hypothesis, run the experiment, and then learn from the uh, data that you actually get and then iterate from there. So we've seen, you know, that after certain iterations, you start building the right product and maybe, maybe you find the right business model. Otherwise, you should, instead of keep uh, iterating, you should pivot, which is a major, a major shift on the, on the company's business model. We've seen how important the business model is, more than sometimes the product itself. I would say that the business model is embedded in the product, or should be embedded in the product as well. So don't have this idea of a product, just an IT uh, tool or something. The product is much more than that. And we've seen how important that was to, to configure this, um, this scalability and, and these other aspects about it. And, and, and the business model is also part of it. So after considering that business model and, and keep that uh, evolution of the product, uh, eventually we will reach the product market fit, which is you know the, the, the marriage, the, the fusion between the product that you launched, the solution that you, that, that you found to a specific problem and the market that actually needs the product and, 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 and flows with you <laughs> in, the, in the right way. You know, it's not only pays, but also it's a recurrent revenue and you know, things get smooth between you and your market because you found the right market and the right business model with the right product. So we've seen that, we've seen also the methodology on how to grow from there, how to, st how to start from an MVP and, and get uh, this product market fit and from there uh, reach what we call traction. This traction was somehow like a, this exponential growth that uh, also we needed to take into account. And furthermore, we've seen the technology behind the startup. You've seen, we've seen many things, I think. Uh, it's almost like a, like a mini MBA for startups. And how technology was very important in order to um, to address the right problem, and and, and finally we, we we learn how to make the right choices about technology, about the product, when to hire the right CTO, and and so on. And, and the final um, workshop, we uh, we covered the uh, funding, the financing of the startup. Not only about growth, but in order to grow, sometimes we need resources, 
and we've seen the different stages about growth, about uh, where to look for, how to deal with an investor and so on. And today we are going to see the final, the final part of the company, which is not uh, in terms of the timeline, the, the final stage, because you know, you're always going to have to, uh, to do this elevator pitch. Uh, but today we're going to see the elevator pitch because in the end, the elevator pitch is just the top of the iceberg per se, uh, or is like the, um, how do you call the, the Ginda? Uh, the, I forgot the name of the, how do you, yeah, no uh, you, yeah. I, I'll try to, uh, the, the cherry pot, the, well, cherry in the pie. Yeah, chair in the pile, yeah. per se. Uh, so you, you get my point, right? So anyway, this is just the chair in the pie or whatever, you, you, you understand my point. Uh, but it's very important in order to raise funds in the different stages of the company. Now, we've seen, I think it's yeah nine minutes, a whole synthesis of 20 hours. So I think it's not, it's not that bad, finally. So if you want to get deeper into that, just go to those previous workshops and, and hope, uh, I hope you enjoy them. So today, I also have to say that I deeply apologize because I made a mistake, it was my fault, it was not the technical team's uh, fault nor the, the business school, uh, but I sent them the wrong presentation in terms of the language. I sent it in Spanish because I thought it was this, today it was a Spanish class. So I hope you can uh, forgive me for, the, for it. It's also a good opportunity to increase and improve your Spanish skills because I will continue the, 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 the presentation in, in, in English, of course, but you, you will see part of the contents in, in Spanish. But you'll get the idea and if not, you can uh, ask me uh, to at Emprender Cuesta, that's my Twitter user, or um, Alvaro at sonarventures.com. You can ask me by email that I can send you the presentation in the right language, okay? So, what are we going to see today specifically? Today we're going to see what is an elevator pitch, what are the different recommendations about uh, how to make the right elevator pitch, and the, different, the structure of the elevator pitch, or moreover, not just the elevator pitch, but also the presentation to investors, which is different, and I will get into that after, you know, because the elevator pitch is a very short synthesis of your, of your business, but most of the time, at least in my experience, uh, uh, you know, three minutes or two minutes is, is nothing. I mean, you, you don't get, you don't do anything with, within two or three minutes. You need a bit more than that. And, and most of the times your presentations will be a bit longer. So today we're going to see the investor's deck and how to make this uh, presentation to cover the main aspects about your business. And that is a very important tool uh, in order to raise money, in order to raise funds. Okay. And finally, we're going to see different exit strategies uh, because in the end, since this is the final stage of, uh, and, and the final part of the course, it's also good to, to learn not just the beginning of a business and how to develop it and grow it, but what is the, somehow the, the final destination of a company, if there is a destination. We'll see that at the end of the, of the, of the conference. So, what is an elevator pitch? Well, first thing uh, you should know is the, the origin of the, of the expression elevator pitch. Probably most of you already know. Uh, some people, they say it, it comes from, uh, you know, uh, a, an anecdote with Bill Gates that someone uh, found him in an elevator and he pitched him. And, but in, 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 in a glance, basically, that, that's what it is. That's what would you tell to Bill Gates if you found him on an elevator and you only had 30 seconds to catch his attention about your business and get to the meeting. And that is very, very important. It's about getting an opportunity to a meeting. This is not uh, like a selling document that, you know, uh, you will just uh, make the, the investor ask you where do I have to send the money, you know? Basically, this is somehow a teaser. This is a, just to get a, a glance of the uh, business idea. So it's a very short and simple description about your business idea that anyone could understand in a very limited time. Uh, here it says in, in the time the elevator takes to, to get to three floors, but 
as I said, it, it's much more than that. It helps to synthesize to synthesize your business uh, proposition, your whole business idea, the different stages that you are, and how that of an opportunity is for uh, different investors. So, uh, other attributes of uh, an elevator pitch, other characteristics. This is not a sales pitch, it's different. You're not going to get a client from there. So the approach is way different. It's about the business opportunity. It's not about how great your business is. It's about how great of a op financial opportunity it is, which is a different approach. So don't use your sales deck in order to um, make a presentation for investors. It also, it's not a pitch about an idea uh, or, or a team of a product. It's about a business, okay? So never talk about a product, never talk about your idea because nobody cares about your ideas, nor my ideas, I'm sorry to say that. They care about businesses if you're willing to, uh, if they're willing to invest. And also, it's, um, it's, it's also a pitch about what does your business, uh, what is your business doing? What is your product uh, solving? And what does it mean for investors, clients, and the whole society as a whole? Okay, so it has these three dimensions. Okay, uh, there are many other uh, there are many other aspects, but uh, many other attributes. But I will I will get into them uh, afterwards. And in fact, it, it's quite funny. It's quite ironic because, believe it or not, I just can I just came uh, half an hour ago from. Um, I mean, giving an elevator pitch of my company. Yeah. So it's very funny. Yeah, I was in a different business school. Uh, there was a, like a whole network of business angels and I was uh, presenting uh, Food in the Box, one of my companies, the one that I, I'm more mm -hmm. focused on. And I had actually eight minutes to give the presentation and then we had other 10 minutes to have a Q&A with the potential investors because we're doing a, another funding round. So as this is a very good example because whatever I'm telling you, I had to apply that to myself today. And even after being a member of the jury in many contests of entrepreneurship and, and stuff like that, or even after um, having given many uh, pitches uh, to different investors, I still get nervous and I still have the pressure of will I do it right, will I do it wrong. Today was a, a very good elevator pitch, but uh, two weeks ago I did a terrible job. So whatever I tell you, uh, it's all about, in the end, it's all about experience and sometimes it depends on other aspects. But at, at least we're going to minimize the, um, the chances of failure of that because it's a very small window of opportunity that, you know, it's synthesized in, a, in this elevator um, situation, but uh, just take that as a metaphor, okay? Uh, sometimes you have just maybe one hour opportunity, sometimes it's half an hour, whatever. Just is a very good opportunity for your business. Uh, sorry, because I got problems with the display. Um, it always happens, I'm sorry. So I don't know how to fix it. Hay problemas con la pantalla. Ahora, there you go. Sorry. Uh, so, in any case, uh, we're going to cover the structure of the um, pitch deck. Of course, this is not a dogma, you can do it your own way. And we're going to talk today about not only the structure, but also some tips or tricks in order to catch the attention or to make a difference. Because, for example, today I had to give a pitch, but there were all other 10 people. Uh, that were not competing against me, but we were competing for the investor's attention. In the end, money is limited and resources are limited. So, uh, you know, also your project will be perceived not as a, in an absolute terms, but also in relative terms mm -hmm. compared to the other projects that we'll present there. So, um, the first element of the, um, of the presentation of the structure, then we'll, we'll see different presentation techniques and tips. But the first element is to talk about a problem, okay? That might sound obvious, but I've seen a lot of elevator pitches that don't do that. They, they start by, you know, they're product-centric 
and even self-centric. Most of them, uh, they start talking about themselves as entrepreneurs. They want to say, this is who I am, and, which is not a bad approach, okay? The, the presenting yourself at the beginning so people get a, an idea of who you are and why you're saying whatever you're going to say for the rest of the presentation. My opinion, I would just mention about yourself when you talk about the team and, and, and mention yourself later. Uh, once you mention the team, then you say something about yourself because it will, it will try to, it will reduce the chances that you will be seen as self-centric or arrogant. Mm -hmm. It will be a sign of leadership that you somehow are putting your team first and then you after and it will not make the pitch about you even though the pitch is about you uh, because uh, we've seen before that the investors in the end they of course invest in the race they invest in the horse but also they invest in the jockey and mm -hmm. and, and the jockey is the main bet uh, for the investors but uh, if the jockey is a self-centric arrogant entrepreneur that uh, there are chances that this guy or this girl will be the same for his or her employees and, and partners yeah. and, and so on. By the way, if you want to interrupt me at any time, make any questions mm -hmm. or make any comments, you're more than welcome so that it will be yep. more um, yep. Great. Uh, easy and, and, and entertaining for and, and, and inspiring or whatever for, for the rest of, of the audience. Uh, so, first thing, I would say problem or need. Um, there are many ways you can start uh, in, that, in that sense. I've seen, I've seen three main ways to, 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 to start uh, to talk about the problem. The first is try to connect with the audience if the problem is a very universal or broad problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, making a rhetorical question or to the audience about has anybody of you been in this situation ever or who here has been into or had this problem that's one way there's a high risk that no one in the audience had that problem or that you don't get a lot of response so that's a risky approach but if you're actually solving a very mainstream problem well then it's somehow easy uh, it's not the same if I ask, uh, wh how many of you in the audience are cooking at home? That's a risky question. If you're talking to a lot of busy people, they might not be cooking at home. And that's the problem I'm trying to solve. But if you ask how many people make a grocery shopping, a weekly grocery shopping in the supermarket, you will get a 95% response. Yeah, everybody does that. Exactly. So... The way you frame the question also conditions the, the, the answer and conditions the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, another way to state this problem is to talk about a personal experience. So that's what I did today. Today I, I started saying that, you know, uh, my father had a, a health issue and, and the doctor, uh, after he had this uh, heart surgery, he sent him a, a, somehow like a, a diet uh, plan that it was like probably it was from the 80s. I mean, the, 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 the nutritional recommendations that he got. And it was just a piece of paper with certain guidelines, you know. Mm -hmm. And he is not in a position to follow those guidelines. And, 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 and he needs um, to cook at home in order to have that diet. It's not a matter of choice. I mean, you cannot... Uh, you cannot buy that in restaurants and, and yeah. be fed on, on restaurants. So making it something personal and emotional connects quickly with the audi audience. It makes it more tangible and also it binds uh, the motivation of the entrepreneur and the problem that he's or she's trying to solve. So it makes uh, it, it works better on that terms. It, it gives more uh, alignment uh, with the vision so that builds credibility because they perceive that he or she will have more motivation in order to solve that. Um, and also it validates the problem. If you're mentioning someone that already had this problem and that's how you found the potential solution. So uh, this problem or need needs to cap uh, capture your attention. I mean, the, 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 the investor's attention. And there are other ways to, to do it. For example, use a sense of humor. That's the most risky. 
uh, I would not take that risk unless you're so confident that you're very funny and that your sense of humor is not politically incorrect, that you're not gonna hurt anyone's feelings. And if you make a joke in the audience and no one laughs, I mean, that's not a good start. So I would just, I would not go that down, uh, down that road. Um, so just try to make it as tangible as possible. Because I've seen entrepreneurs that they say, uh, did you know that 45% of the Americans uh, have this problem? And yes, of course, it's data-oriented, it's good, but you haven't convinced me of anything. I mean, statistics, we all know that, you know, you can find statistics, yeah. you can make them up, and, and somehow... No one's going to check them. Exactly, and, and is, is, there's no double check, and, and I think it, it's not a good way to start. You can then support your uh, hypothesis and your uh, statement of the problem with the statistics. For example, today I started uh, speaking about food in the box, about you know the fact that first I, I made a general um, observation, which is you know today nowadays either because we are concerned about health because you're young millennials and we concern uh, concern about eating healthy because we are concerned about our health or the not so young people that are not just concerned, but they're somehow forced or in need yeah. to solve this, uh, you know, uh, healthy diet issue because they already have cholesterol, uh, heart diseases, uh, diabetes, mm -hmm. or uh, some other uh, diseases or limitation, health limitations. So that was the state, the general statement of the problem. Then I, I said, so that people like my father, and then I, I mentioned my father, or like my girlfriend, who became a vegetarian and is not capable to find uh, vegetarian recipes and, and restaurants and, and, and so on. So I, I then went from general to something very particular, and then I used the Google Trends uh, analysis on healthy recipes, the, the search, and just to show the pattern, how it went from 2016 to 2018 just to show the, the graph from a very objective yeah. point of view. So general perspective, emotional and personal uh, validation of the problem and my motivation to solve it. And uh, then I try to empathize with the audience saying, probably most of you already had that problem. I don't know about you, but at least I get home very late from work. And sometimes the last thing I want is to get uh, home and, 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 and just have to cook something and, and plan my groceries and so on. So then I, I somehow I put them into, into the problem, but I didn't officially ask them, okay? So as you can see, I, I stated the problem from different dimensions, but they need to, it needs to be anchored because most of the, uh, of the investors, they need to know, and the, the main question they, they, they want to ask you is, what problem are you solving? It's very important. So that's how I started. Uh, I'm, of course, I'm dissecting the, 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 the whole speech. It was eight minutes, so uh, it was all very, very, very fast, you know, very quick. Um, but then uh, it was not just about the, the, the problem about the the concern that we have about health, because that's not actually a problem, but the, the actual problem, and that, that's why you need to state specifically the problem, uh, was, okay, we are concerned about health, we want to cook, but we have a new problem from the 20th, uh, 21st century, and the way to solve it is according to the 20th century. I mean, home cooking is outdated, it's obsolete. The way we shop, the way we do grocery shopping, the way we plan, we don't know what we're buying, we, we, we end up throwing a lot of uh, food that we... Mm -hmm. And then I, I start uh, talking about the problem in depth, about the, the real pain that the user has. So it's not about, hey, it's nice to have, to be healthy, or we need to be healthy. That's somehow like a broad problem, but then we need to be specific, because then your whole speech will be anchored on that specific pain, okay? Uh, when you, and, and it doesn't matter if you focus a lot uh, of the speech on the, on the pain that you're solving because whatever you say, once again, the, the better you prove your, uh, the pain you're solving, 
the better of a, of a market opportunity you are building. Okay, so uh, that's, that's a, a very important point. Then uh, we say, okay, yes, so that's the problem, but let's talk about the solution. Don't, uh, first advice, don't put on your, on, your, on your pitch deck or your elevator pitch, whatever, on your presentation, problem and then solution. Okay, that's, that's way too academic. I've seen that many times as well. And it gives an amateurish um, uh, image of the presentation because it feels like you're following a, somehow like an outline or, or a guideline mm -hmm, yeah. and it's it's not actually the way it goes you know it needs to go smooth so you talk about the problem and then you th you think about okay this is this this is how we found a potential solution but we you don't outline that in the in the in the slide so you you talk about the solution which is the actual value proposition in a way so first thing is how are you going to solve how are you solving this problem what is it about uh, don't get too technical because that will you will lose all the the audience they don't care about the technicalities if they do care because it's a very specific audience they will ask you in the Q&A but just don't don't try to which is something that I've seen many times as well don't try to get like to stack a lot, a lot of technical details, a lot of info on the presentation, because that's one of the most common issues I've seen. I was waiting uh, in this in this uh, little office uh, to be called to you know to, to make this presentation, and I was seeing the some of the other entrepreneurs that were reviewing their their presentations, and. Perhaps they will, they're much better entrepreneurs, they will get uh, millions in funding. I don't know, I'm not one to judge. But I just as for the presentation outline, I was thinking, oh my goodness, uh, they're going to get confused. I, I, I saw this, this uh, what they call death by PowerPoint. Well, that's, that's very important. People, they try to stack all these bullet points, a lot of info, a lot of... Uh, numbers and trends and graphs and they don't care the investors they just want to get a glance uh, they you need to explain that to them as if they were seven year old people really it needs to be super clear mm -hmm. they are listening to you but at the same time they're whatsapping uh, so you want to keep them engaged exactly but at the same time uh, understand the everything and exactly. wait for the next thing you see the problem you tell them the solution Exactly. You play with their emotions, mm -hmm. uh, but if you put the, the, the screen full of data, yeah. uh, you lose them. Yeah. Exactly. So it might some, uh, sound obvious for some of you, but I see it every day. It's, it's incredible, really. It's, it's, it's a shame. So keep it simple, as you see uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the slides. Keep it uh, the, 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 the KISS principle, it's called keep it simple, stupid, okay? The less is more, whatever you want to say. Um, the more graphical, the more, um, uh, how would I say, um, the more images you have, uh, but at the same time, the more rigorous you do it, is it, a very difficult balance, but I think you get my idea. Basically, you need to understand that the PowerPoint is not the center of the presentation. You are the center of the presentation. So if you make people just look at the PowerPoint, they will lose it. They will. They will not actually. They will listen. remember you exactly. You need to capture their attention. Mm -hmm. So if they, if if you put a lot of data or even images and refer to them continuously, you're doing it wrong, on my point of view. Um, you need to have them uh, engaged uh, with you. Just look at their eyes, uh, look at the different parts of the audience, uh, try to get personal, just try to seem enthusiastic, but not over enthusiastic. Not, you're not a smoke seller. You need to seem self-confident. If you move too much, it will be uh, a sign of lack of confidence. It's funny because uh, I've seen, um, I got a, um, 
I think it was this weekend. Some of my, uh, my uh, someone from my team, she sent um, a video recording of one of the elevator pitches that I did. Uh, it was a, more of a presentation of the company to a very broad audience. And it's funny when, when you see yourself, you yeah, know, different uh, perspective. Uh, the different yeah. perspective. You think you're doing a good job, and honestly, I mean, I was moving way too much because at that point. That's the one I mentioned before that I did terrible. Well, I mean, the audience didn't think that so, as much as I thought, but I thought it was the worst presentation I've ever done, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I was feeling uh, nervous, but I was not aware in, until I saw it, how that was projected to the audience. Mm -hmm. And it was incredible because then you would move your hands too much, you would walk uh, way too much, you will seem like hyperactive. It's not a good sign. Neither the contrary. Neither being static and you know without moving and, and, and without expression. So just find the right balance. Okay. In any case, don't don't forget that you are the center of attention of the presentation, and the presentation is is good to support what you're saying. But you're not just reading whatever. Uh, it's on the on the screen okay so problem solution but then you might think okay yes but how many people uh, have this problem because yes you've proven that there is this problem but if there's not a, a, a big enough market then uh, it might be a great solution but not a great business opportunity yeah. so uh, it's more important than, than most entrepreneurs think to state how big the market is. That shows the, the size of the opportunity and at the same time the size of your ambition. Uh, one of the mistakes I, I did once was to just to, to, to state the Spanish market as my, my market because I wanted to be prudent, you know, to say, hey, you know, I'm not thinking uh, on internationalization yet although eventually it will come, but just the fact that I just narrowed it to the, to the local market, uh, just got one of the investors told me, hey, you know, this is not an ambitious enough project. Yeah. You know, your numbers, your, it's not ambitious enough. And don't forget, they need to multiply times 10 or 20, your, I mean, the, the money that you're investing, otherwise they will not make a, 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 you know, a profitable investment considering that considering that 90% of their investments will eventually fail, okay? So the market opportunity is very important. Once again, don't get way too complex. You've, you see here in the, in the slides a very graphical approach, you know, you see the percentage of the, of the population, uh, the, um, the actual archetype of your potential user or your, of, or your customer segments. It's very good to show that you know the market not in terms of the size, but also in terms of the demand uh, and what are the different players, not just your competitors, but other players, players that are solving the same problem in a different way. For example, today I used, I used one uh, a new slide that I tried to explain my company in terms of convenience and health. So on one extreme, I mentioned Just Eat as zero healthy, super convenient. Yeah. You want to have dinner, you just click on what Just Eat, get a pizza, 20 minutes, you get it. Delivery, whatever. Uh, and on the other extreme was like, a, you know, a nutritionist and, and doing your own, you doing your own grocery shopping and, and cooking everything on a very planned menu, which is zero convenient and maybe super healthy. And so then we positioned ourselves and like, it's convenient, but less than just it, but at the same time, super healthy, like from seven, uh, and, and seven to 10, uh, health. Uh, approach and that was somehow gave an idea of the different players in the different uh, segments according to that uh, trade-off between convenience and health you can you can do other uh, other graphs like that but that shows that you know your market and 
you're aware that you're not the only person or the business that is solving that problem and that is not the only way to you to solve that problem okay so uh, just try to, to to show that graphically okay and then just just don't forget that the next competitors as I was mentioning uh, it needs to be a picture of you and your competitors, but if you make it, uh, if you look way too good, then it's not a realistic approach. So you need to be somehow rigorous and realistic about your, um, about the picture, of, about your picture in the market, but at the same time, uh, in a graphical uh, way, you need to, you know, state the different um, advantages the, and competitive advantages that you have compared to other approaches, other competitors or other ways to, to see this, uh, this problem. So very important, just identify your competitors and, and identify your competitive advantage in a very graphical way, okay? The next part, okay, we've, we've convinced them that there is a huge problem, we've connected emotionally with them, then we, uh, we stated, okay, this is our solution, Great, these are the different attributes of our solution. Now, we mentioned the market, this is a huge market opportunity, and these are the players. If there are no players, you should worry, you know. This is my competition. This is my weaknesses and my strengths with my competition. This is the market size, the, even either both now and, and potentially. This is how big the market is, and then it's good to have some KPIs and statistics to, to reinforce your, your statements in that, in that matter. Because once again, this is all about balance, about balance between emotion and, and data, between motivation and ambition. I mean, motivation in a, like a, in a, in a, in a world change, uh, and, and at the same time ambition in making them rich. So it's, it's a good combination. But then it's very important to say, okay, I have the right product, let's say, but how do I make money? And when you say about how do I make, when you talk about how do I make money, it's not just about how are people going to pay um, in terms of where is the money coming from, but also how am I acquiring the customers, which it's slightly different, okay? Because one thing is saying customers will pay for recipes and then they will pay for a weekly subscription and I will get money from them with this margin, okay? That should be the business model, but this, they want to know because it's not the first company they listen to, uh, they want to know how are you going to get those users? Because each and every investor or professional investor knows probably better than you how difficult it is to acquire customers. So when you talk about your business model, not just think about how are users paying, but how are you actually getting to those users? You, mm -hmm. you see my point? Yeah. So, for example, today I said, first thing I said was, um, okay, I'm going to talk about the problem, the solution, whatever. I explained what a meal kit was and the whole value proposition and what you do when you order, you get the box, ingredients, you cook it, and so on. And then I said, okay, but we all know how difficult it is to acquire customers uh, directly. And on an average, is about 60 to 100 euros to acquire a new customer uh, for this uh, type of uh, product or service. So the numbers don't make sense. Yeah, you need to sell a lot of meal kits in order to actually uh, make a reasonable amount of money. So we explained how we acquire the customers by partnering with these brands, these other partners, these supermarkets. So we explained the relationship we have with them and how those partners would help us to get clients and then we help them we I explain them how these clients actually use our service and pay for it so explain the whole picture not just the clients getting to your website this is how to get those clients to your website okay so uh, business model 
very important, more important than the product sometimes. That's what the, the investor is going to look for. And uh, also uh, very important, how much money you burn per month. What is your burn rate? Your burn rate is, um, for them, is one, if, if you don't say it, they will ask you. I mean, it's like a mandatory question. If you don't know how much money you're burning, uh, they will not be able to, to calculate that the money you, you're asking for, uh, what is the runway? How much, how much time are you buying to get to the next milestone? You know? Mm -hmm. So if you're burning $15,000 uh, per month and you're asking for $75K, uh, they say you're going to be short on cash very okay. soon. Uh, if you ask, if you're burning 15k and you're asking for half a million, uh, you need to explain very well why you need so much money, uh, especially if you're not a B2C business, so you're a B2B2C business. So, ban rate is also very important, very important, and how much, uh, um, and somehow what is the structure of that ban rate, but that you can get later. So, business model, once again. Then the team, hmm. you somehow already uh, got them uh, convinced about the, the size of the opportunity, the problem, the solution, the business model, the, 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 the client acquisition uh, model, but then they, they will think, okay, but in the end, if you say that in I just got your presentation and told a bunch of friends to start this idea and this business model. What makes me not do it and what makes you the right person and the right team to take this opportunity? Because most of the time, uh, the business opportunities are not standalone business opportunities. It's a, it's, a, it's a combination between the opportunity and the team arranged to take that opportunity. So it's very important that in an elevator pitch, uh, you state how balanced the team is, but just don't get too specific. I've seen a, a very common mistake to talk about the CV of the, each and every team member. And honestly, they don't care that much. They just want to understand that you're not a typical company where all the members are technical, for example. So you have a right balance between what we've discussed earlier about the hacker, the hustler, and the hipster. Okay, if you prove that in in, in fifteen seconds, you you you're okay. You're all set. Okay. Many people lose a lot of. I mean, just uh, sorry to, to rewind, but just think that your main limitation in uh, in when you uh, present your company is time. Is is very important that you don't lose time. The worst thing you can do when you when you expand your business is to get stuck in the middle of the presentation and time's up, and then you need like ten seconds to finish the whole rest of the presentation, which is probably the, the most important details that will uh, that will make them interested on, on getting to know you farther. So important to calibrate your time to rehearsal uh, to rehearse your presentation but when you rehearse that presentation you will you will see that you might be tempted to explain and get into too much detail about the team and once again just think that with that slide all you need to do is are they qualified enough are they, ba are they balanced enough between sales and product and operations is it an experienced team or is it a junior team and and then it's a great opportunity to talk about you and your co-founder because that will, they, will, they will want to know whether you're a solo founder, you have a co-founder, or you're three co-founders. Statistically speaking, if you're just a solo founder, your chances of success are much lower. If you, they say that statistically speaking, it's the three co-founders that uh, have the highest chance of, um, of success. Mm -hmm. And two co-founders, who they will pay attention when they see the two co-founders, is uh, how complementary they are. So, once again, this is not a LinkedIn profile, this is not a, a job interview, 
don't they don't care about whether they went to these great business schools or no just say just use 15 seconds to talk about a balanced complementary experienced passionate team and most important about yourself and your co-founder how complementary you are and what is your ex why and what makes you the right leader to take that uh, opportunity because they will trust you that uh, on the fact that you will um, recruit the right team so I, I mentioned about myself of course the last person so you know it's a sign of humil uh, humility uh, humbleness um, and basically what I said it was that I've been an entrepreneur for more than two years and that I've sold two startups and that I also failed uh, more than three startups so to them was a sign that you know uh, at least he's experienced enough to and he knows what he's doing that's the idea I'm not saying that's the case okay I'm not putting myself on that I'm just saying that the, what you need to project is that aspect of the uh, of the team and then I just uh, just a picture and in fact one advice that I would give you is don't put just their their images like their pictures just try to get a picture of the whole team together because it will have a more emotional impact and it will show that you're not just collecting different pictures of some friends that you somehow uh, put there just to pretend that you have a super incredible team uh, because uh, that will not build uh, trust so just try to get a, a picture with the team and, and, and you will be more trustworthy basically don't do what I have done in this presentation just do what I did in the presentation today uh, that I made a whole picture with a with a whole team so um, Another aspect that is critical for an investor is that, as we've mentioned in, in, in previous um, workshops or sessions, is that ultimately the investor makes an emotional decision that is 90% based on emotional uh, data, but at the end she cooks the emotional data and rationalize it in order to to make a final output so she needs the right ex uh, excuse in order to take to make the decision that already made emotionally speaking okay so what do I mean by that that if you just explain that this team is great that this opportunity is super cool that, that you will change the world and you're very passionate and, and so on but you don't give any numbers any KPIs any any data you will not help the investor to rationalize uh, the decision mm -hmm. and to actually understand that you're not just talking bullshit but you're also um, actually know your data and you're data driven because one of the things that investors hate is that you're just passion and, and nothing else because that's like a very naive approach of entrepreneurship they know that every entrepreneur that is successful is uh, half passion half and uh, have data so uh, you need to prove that in the presentation just don't do it too early you know first have them engaged and then say and I've done my homework here are my KPIs you know and, and that all, it, it gives and it, it sends a sign that you're not just bringing up the KPIs for the presentation but if you can put those KPIs in a way that and, and also reinforce that in your presentation saying and of course you will get those KPIs in this dashboard that we send on a weekly basis you will send a double message a triple message first yeah, you're data driven second that you are uh, that you are aware that your investors uh, will get reporting because it's, it's, it's one of the main uh, fears that they have that they put their money and the investor and, and the um, and the entrepreneur never reports back until when things are going great or terrible but normally 
it's it's something that they hate. So if they uh, if you help them to just check that um, part on the on their investors checklist uh, about is this person going to report me adequately? Is this person data driven? Is this person uh, aware that it's not just passion, but also that this market opportunity is giving me? Uh, are you, is she giving me reasons to make this investment, or at least to get deeper into the conversation? Well, then use KPIs. And these KPIs, of course, you need to be realistic. Just don't 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 lie. You know, it sounds cliche. It sounds obvious, but. They are used to see so many people that uh, lie in their presentations and it's very easy to, to catch and, and just to find a, a contradiction. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, almost today I, I got into, into that situation. I, I was presenting the KPIs and one of the investors interrupted me and said, but you say this and that you sold that uh, money, that much money, and the recipes that you say and the boxes that you say that you sold are this. How does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And well, he, I was not lying because then I explained to him because of this and this and this and say, oh, okay, okay. And it was great. But if that had been a lie and instead of a, a, a strategic decision because there was another business line that it was not just boxes, mm -hmm. I would have been humiliated. Uh, and I would, I would have lost this yeah. uh, opportunity and lo all my credibility. And, and this um, ecosystem of, of investors is also very small. So, um, you know, uh, most of them, they call each other and they, they ask about references. Funny, believe it or not, I mean, I'm not making this up because I'm, I'm talking about it today. But this morning, it's funny because I got a call at... 8.15 in the morning, in the morning, which it's not something common yeah, in Spain, no, not really. <laughs> uh, from one of my investors, uh, at least he asked me, is it too early to call? But I said, of course not, you know, I've been... It's an investor. <laughs> yeah, of course. So um, he called me this morning and he said, I just wanted to ask you a question, you know, I, I, I know that you know this company and... I want to know your opinion about it and your analysis about it because mm -hmm. we're considering an investment. So before making an investment, they actually uh, do their homework. And once again, they support the decision they want to make. Yeah. And if they wanted to, for example, what I told them is like, I love the team behind this project. I just don't believe in their business model. Just, just to sum it up. And he said, oh, that's what I wanted to hear. And thank you so much. And we'll discuss a little bit. But in, in a way, I helped him to confirm what he already knew. But he needed this, you know, uh, uh, this third party uh, approach to confirm his decision. So just, just, just as an example to, to let you know that investors don't just ask you and they will believe whatever you tell them. They will ask other people, other investors, other entrepreneurs, and they will make a background check about you. And so if you say you're selling more than you actually do, just you, they, will, they, will, they will get you, okay? So uh, KPIs, you need to talk about the past and the future. So you might be thinking, okay, yes, but what if I'm starting? the company, how do I mention the KPIs, you know? Well, just um, just consider that um, what well, we've discussed before, uh, if, if, you, if you don't have KPIs, you probably should, shouldn't go fundraising. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I think it, it would be a very big mistake. You just, um, uh, you have the enough resources today to, to validate your main hypothesis without asking for external sources of money and so just just be humble about it and it's funny because um, I was uh, I was in a partner in one of the in, in, in a startup that they did this in a very in a very intelligent way 
they showed KPIs worse than they actually had. And it's something, it might be counterintuitive. And I asked them, why are you doing this? I mean, why are you uh, talking about your experiment instead of your reality? And this person told me, there are two types of investments. The ones that are based on expectations and there are ones that are based on reality. If I talk about today's KPIs, you can consider them good, bad, okay, great, whatever, but you're in the reality of the KPIs. Yeah. But if you have stated the right problem, the right solution, the team, the, the opportunity and everything, and you only say, hey, I've done this experiment and these are the main uh, you know, a priori results, um, then it's more of an expectation that you're, so they need to put the money in order to see what's gonna happen. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes there are certain types of business models and companies that they need to uh, be sold on expectation uh, at the very early stages of, of the company. Of course, you cannot do that after two years uh, in uh, having the company running. So first thing, just try to be realistic, even pessimistic. But at the same time, let's be honest, just uh, don't forget that oh, it's a visual language. So if you can somehow uh, optimize your graphical approach of your KPIs and just use the, you know, they, they want, they just want to see curves going up, yeah, up. <laughs> and, uh, and to perceive that there is traction. Just don't forget that you are just helping them to confirm what they already have in their mind. So just show them that whatever experiment you've done, whatever KPIs you have, or depending on the stage that you are, that you have traction, that you are growing, okay? Otherwise, you will be like shooting uh, yourself on the, on the feet, okay? So be realistic, but at the same time be rigorous, but at the same time try to optimize your KPIs in terms of the expectation management and the visual uh, impact that the, the KPIs will will have, and just just try to look good on the picture. You don't have to. It doesn't. It doesn't be. It doesn't have to be a photoshopped picture. It doesn't have to be a fake picture. Just just, just don't put the bad picture. I mean, would you? If you are on Tinder or Facebook, would you put the worst picture of you? No. If you put your best picture, does that mean that you're a liar? No, you're just optimizing your image. Yeah, of course. So just, it might sound obvious, but I've seen many people that they want to be like rigorous, which is great, but they, they, they put the worst picture. Just, just try to take that into account. And, and try to, in this case, try to be as visual as possible. If you overwhelm the audience with KPIs, it will be a problem. Just be synthetic and be very graphical about uh, just, uh, as you can see in this, in this slide, uh, you see uh, revenues versus expenses, you see, you know, uh, going up, you've seen the, the main um, KPIs, the circles that you see in the, on the slide are because they're the actual KPIs, or well, were the actual KPIs back time, back then. Uh, and also, um, as you see, there's a, a picture of a roadmap. So they need to contextualize the information that you give them. Um, I was telling them today, oh, this is the money that we've made, the, the boxes that we sold, whatever. But they didn't know how to interpret it. Uh, I had to say, well, we started in 2016 with this, uh, then 17, we, we made this amount of money in these KPIs. Now we've already done this, but uh, we want to reach within two years to this amount because we have these other KPIs that prove that we can reach to that point. What are the, what are the uh, KPIs that might help you to, to reach to that point? And this is very important, the unit economics. That's what most investors will look just to try to understand your business. They don't know if making 300K on boxes is good or bad. They don't know. They know they, you're growing, okay, but they don't know if that's small size or big size. 
they don't know if uh, having this number of customers per month is good or bad. What they know is that if you have a cost per acquisition of 100 and each customer um, is returning 80 euros in, in the lifetime of the customer, that's a terrible business. Um, and if you're spending 80 euros on each customer and you're making 500 euros on each uh, new customer, that means that the business is scalable and the fact that you say, if the market is big enough uh, and you're saying that with their investment you can grow up to that point, that's, that's uh, credible, you know, because of the unit economics. They will want to know how your unit economics will be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's really important. Not just uh, revenues and expenses, but also cost per acquisition, lifetime value, that's the main equation they want to know, mm -hmm. and gross margin. That, and if you, depending on your business, the, uh, the churn rate or the recurrency, because that's a very good indicator of the health of the business. If people are returning, means that you're solving a problem, not, and you're not just acquiring customers the right way, but you're actually solving the right problem and they keep coming back, so yeah. that's a healthy business, okay? I had a chance to, to speak to one of my partners. She's the CEO of Deliveroo in, in Spain, and, and she's one of the first, I mean, the, the early investors in, in Food in the Box. And she, she joined the team uh, a few months after Deliveroo had closed a, a round of 100 million. 100 million. Not bad. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. And I asked her, it's like, how, how do you do that? I mean, how, how did that happen, you know? And, and she told me uh, that she was actually asking that to herself. It's like, how, how did they get this, uh, this uh, money? And, and she said, well, I asked that to an investor and he told me that the main KPI that made them uh, make uh, the final decision was recurrency. They, the, exactly. The app. They knew that <clears throat> the fact that the customers were coming back, that showed that they had an incredible product, that they were really solving the problem. And yes, maybe acquiring customers was expensive, but in the long run, with those, um, with those uh, KPIs, that was a very healthy business. Mm -hmm. And they, it would be very, it was a competitive advantage by itself having that, that recurrency. Yeah. Because that means that the rest of the competitors that had nothing to do with that, that recurrency. So that was thanks to a bunch of things that they didn't want to analyze. That's what she was telling me. They, they didn't care about the customer experience, the operations, the, uh, the technology behind the app. The, they didn't, I mean, they care, but it's all an indicator of uh, the different parts of a good customer experience. So the best health indicator of a good customer experience is recurrency. Yeah. If they don't keep coming back, it doesn't matter what you tell them. It's just about yeah. if they keep coming back, right? So um, I would say that KPIs and unit economics are very, very important. Just keep them simple and visual. Now, uh, as most presentations and as the, the McKinsey method uh, tells you, each PowerPoint, each presentation has to have a final question, which is, so what? So what? That's what, you know, when you listen to something, it's like, okay, yes, it's great what you're telling me. Call to action call to action, the CTA, the so what? What are you asking for? How much? What do you want, what, what do you want to do with it? And uh, how are you going to distribute my money and, 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 and why, you know? Uh, because if you're asking for 100K and you just want that for salaries, and especially the co-founder salaries, it's not a good way to ask money, you know? But if you are, and, and they, it's also a way for them to understand which stage you are at. 
um, investors tend to think in terms of uh, whether you're financing a, a product risk or a market risk. At the beginning, your main risk is, is product based. And then once you've built the product, of course, according to the market, uh, along with the market, then when you have the right product and the right KPIs and you start, you somehow have this product market fit and you ask them for money to scale, they will evaluate if this is market risk or not. So product risk, market risk, whether you want it for marketing expenses or investment or you want it to, uh, to the money for technology, just don't ask for too much money just on the overheads because that doesn't send a, a good sign up. Yeah. Okay. So it's either IT or online marketing or or acquisition. Okay. So uh, in the so what or the call to action, it's very important that you're realistic. Not just in the presentation, in the, in the way you you structure your funding round. You don't necessarily have to talk about your business valuation. Sometimes it's good to. Uh, just to hide it, unless it's mandatory for the presentation, but normally it's not. Um, and it's, I, would, I would say that it's a, it's a common mistake to include the valuation of the company because if someone is interested, but they say, I mean, let's put it this way, it only counts against you. If it's way too expensive, it might dissuade a potential interested investor, which is the main ob objective of, of, the, of the elevator pitch. And if it's too cheap, then it will be taken as amateurish, it will be taken as desperate. Uh, so it can only play against you. If you say we're looking for a 300k, and this is what, or 150 or 75 or 1 million, whatever it's it's very important just to say we are asking for this in order to reach the next destination they want to know not just what you're going to do with it but what is the next milestone because otherwise it will be like a leap of faith if, to see if eventually things will get better or you will find the next round but no just don't forget this metaphor of uh funding as uh, as, as, a, as a as a journey and funding is your gas. So basically you're asking for gas to get to a certain uh, distance. And, and the next destination is your next uh, gas station <laughs> in a way. Yeah. So you need to state clearly what will be your next gas station. Either you are asking for money because you want to um, finish the product and get early traction so that you close a, 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 a certain round or you just asking money because you want to reach the break-even point so that you become sustainable and therefore you can you know uh, grow organically and, and maybe uh, scale at the right time but at least you're sustainable or you ask for money because you already have the product and you validated that your cost per acquisition is this and it's a very important time to market so you need a lot of money to grow super fast and that's why you need to do that or you're doing an, what it's called a pre-IPO, which is very rare in Spain, but other countries is common. So that basically you're asking money to, you know, basically uh, grow the business so much so that you do a successful IPO, uh, initial public offering. So once again, it's not just what the use of the funds, but the strategic approach and the next milestone of those, of those funds. That's, that's very important. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, very important just to give a whole strategic roadmap on on the on the funding roadmap. Okay, this is how I, I'm. Uh, this is we we've raised. For example, today I, I didn't mention that before we had raised more than three hundred fifty k. So they asked me, it's like, how much money have you raised before, and how much money the investors that you're putting here have already invested. Uh, so it's important to know to tell them to put in context so far we've raised this money now we want to raise this money uh, if it's not the first presentation 
and you already have uh, a lead investor or some investors already committed into the project, it's good to say that because it will lower the risk for them. That will be like, it's more important than you think, if it's true, of course. To, to mention that you already have a lead investor, uh, that you already re raised whatever percentage, if it's more than 30%, say it, uh, so that <clears throat> they will, it will trigger the, the, what it's called the FOMO, the fear of missing out, the, the fear of, you know, this is a market opportunity, but the, a business opportunity, but there's scarcity in terms of time, because mm -hmm. if I don't move quickly and, and I don't prove that I'm interested, <clears throat> maybe this opportunity will be, you know, just passing, uh, you know, um, yeah. over me and, 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 and I will feel stupid. That's the worst thing it can happen to an investor. Uh, one of the worst things, I think, uh, is to, to have the opportunity to invest in a, in, in a, in a super project and say no. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and many investors they, they say that publicly they say I had this project and I had to say no and I regret it and you know it's, it's complicated imagine all the people that had Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or WhatsApp or uh, yeah and, and they say huh, who's going to communicate using 140 characters I mean what's the point yeah. when you can say that on Facebook or things like that you know True. so um, so you need to play with that. They, they're afraid that that can happen to them, okay? Uh, as I mentioned in the previous session, they are strategic about their investment. So be strategic about the investment as well. Don't forget that, okay? You're not in an inferiority position, but you can, so just don't put yourself on that. It's very important. Because in, an elevate, in, a, in a funding round, time runs against you, and it goes in favor of the investor by default. The more time she can get uh, from the moment that she sees the project until the moment that sends the money, the more information that she will have in order to understand the business and the, the risk and, and, and the, the, the growth rates and, 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 and the more information, so the, the higher the risk that the, the investment will not happen. And the longer it takes for you to get the money, the higher the chances of failure you will have, uh, and the less value you will be in a, you will be uh, adding to your company uh, in terms of sales, product, team, whatever. So this, there is this contradictory incentives that you need to re to realign. So uh, eventually, what they will say is like, it's interesting, you know, most investors they. I mean, some investors, they, they say, they never say no, they just say not at the moment. So they don't lose the chance to get back, you know. Um, so you need to, to uh, somehow to balance out this, uh, this, um, this incentives. Basically by saying, hey, to create an urgency uh, feeling, to create a scarcity, uh, to create a fear of missing out, and at the same time, they will create expectations that they are interested, but at the same time, they will try to um, uh, avoid uh, asking you to, to send the money because it's against their own interest. Yeah, just keep one feet exactly. on the board in case it's the right boat to exactly. say, yeah. So you might think, oh yeah, but he's, he's a jazz and he's super interested. But unless you say the boat is leaving, mm -hmm. Uh, you can stay in that situation forever. Yeah. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Really, I've suffered it, okay? Um, okay, so I think we are at the final uh, stage of the presentation and at the same time we're at the final stage of the of the company uh, at, the same, uh, at this point because we're going to talk about the exit or the end of a company, if, if any. Um, there, are two, there are two types of businesses. Uh, there are many, but just to, to simplify. The ones that are what it's called somehow, well, it's not a lifestyle business, but it's like an organic growth business, sustainable, and where 
they want to you know get the milk from the cow uh, as for as long as as it's possible mm -hmm. and sell the milk and, and and that's one type of business or the type of business that wants to feed the cow so much that in the end what you're selling is the cow itself that someone is gonna kill it so yeah. it's, it's like a different it's a complete different approach it's funny because today some of the investors ask me that it's like oh so when you mentioned you're not making that much money in this is because you because it really doesn't matter because what you're selling is the whole business opportunity so that when the right time with the right time comes an external player will come and ha will have to buy you so it doesn't matter how much money you're making already because mm -hmm. there will be peanuts anyway for that yeah. huge buyer it's like exactly yeah. <laughs> so they got it and they they want to understand what is the type of business that you're building are you you are you doing are you building a business to be to have an exit uh, in these terms or are you building a business to have an exit in these other terms or not exit at all and that's one of the things that most investors they pay attention to it's funny they will tell you that they will not they they will ask they will tell you that they want you to create value and then exit might come but honestly I don't believe it I mean because it's obvious I mean an investor especially if he's a venture capitalist what she's willing is to invest whatever amount of money and they need even by you know because of their bylaws of the of the investment vehicle that they have they need to get an exit they need to have this money liquid yeah. so so eventually they need to know that you want to sell the company if I mean they what they don't want is you to speculate on the company because that will be a bad signal in terms of the commitment you will get for the team, the commitment that you will get from yourself as an entrepreneur, and the passion that you will have because it, it, it's a way to uh, pragmatic approach, but at least they want to know that you're ambitious, but if the right time comes and there's a, a buyer, you're more than willing to buy. Mm -hmm. And that is very important. So there are two types of businesses, the one, if you want to kill the cow or just want to uh, get the, the milk to milk it. Yeah, basically to make it so you need to understand what type of business you have and if you don't want to uh, kill the cow you should reconsider fundraising because then it will be a conflict of interest mm -hmm. and the type of uh, shareholders agreement that you will have to sign will, will, will limit you on that aspect because if you are not willing to sell they will be able to sell and they will look for a buyer and most of the clauses, uh, I mean, let's say 98% of the shareholders agreement that involve a professional investor, they have what they call a drag along clause or a tag along clause. And the drag along, what it means is that if they got stuck because they got 25% of your company and you're not willing to sell because you just want to milk it forever and just you know, uh, retire with that company and live out of the milk you're making each and every year, they don't care about it most of the time. I'm, of course, I'm overgeneralizing. Um, because they want you to sell it. So if they, if they look for a buyer and the buyer says, okay, yes, I'm interested, but I don't care about your 25%. Either I buy the company or not. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, yes, but I have only 25%, so I don't have a majority of the company. But then there's this clause that says the drag along clause. If the offer of acquisition is big enough, considering certain parameters, the entrepreneur is forced to sell the company. So it's good to know uh, when it comes to, I mean, it's very important to know the end of your journey because that will help you. And, and also I will use that as a way to finish. Uh, that will help you. I mean, to, to start your journey, at least having a glance of where you want to reach, it will, find, it will help you, first, to enjoy the ride instead of the destination. Second, to have the right purpose and just to be clear about it all the time. 
to find the right partners along the way because they will at least they will share the same destination otherwise you will have a misalignment and that will create a lot of friction along the way because if you wanted to travel together but you finally don't want to go to the same destination eventually your your paths will will separate so it's good to state that mm -hmm. from the very beginning at least to have an idea you know things change but uh, to have an idea and and it's also very important to have make that clear to investors well maybe not so clear let them ask you just just have that in mind okay let them ask you and and because most sometimes it can play more against you than in your favor uh, it's better so that they ask you so you want an early exit or you want a long-term exit or what you want to do the best politically correct answer is the one I, sh I normally give uh, so that I don't take a compromise um, is well I'm willing to have not just a full-time commitment but a full life commitment to this company uh, at the same time I'm not too greedy about this company and if there is another player that can create more value and make more impact than I can make by myself, either as a CEO or as a standalone business, in the end what I want to do is create value and have a, a massive uh, impact. So if there is a potential offer, I'm more than happy to evaluate it as long as it's according to my values and my purpose. That shows your passion, your commitment, but at the same time your flexibility and your willingness to to understand that is a you know this is all about business and about investments and about return on investment and and in, in the end the journey of the investor ends in a in a in an exit. But at the same time, I I, I mentioned the the possibility that uh, maybe uh, I'm also open to potential buyers that might want to just buy uh, my shareholders uh, shares and uh, if they do so I will be willing to continue as a CEO of the business mm -hmm. even though uh, the company already acquired the, the other shares which means that um, I'm willing to work for the buyer per se which yeah. is a good sign because uh, it means that they can get out even though if you want to still remain at least there is yeah. a way out for them okay so that's it. I hope uh, it was useful. Uh, don't don't overestimate uh, the elevator pitch. In the end, it's about you. Uh, it's about your team and your skills as an entrepreneur. But at the same time, if you have the chance, if you have this window of opportunity, if you find Bill Gates in, in the elevator, uh, at least you were you will increase your chances of of seizing that opportunity because there are not many opportunities uh, there are not many waves in in your life as an entrepreneur so at least make sure that the ones that come you should take them uh, the best way possible and with the with the highest uh, chances of uh, of success and this is what I've been trying to do you know along the way this uh, this course just to show that Entrepreneurship is hard, but at the same time it can be fun, that is very challenging, but at the same time it's rewarding and it's very stimulating, that at the same time uh, the, the risks are high, but there are many methodologies and dimensions of how to lower those risks and, and, optimize, the, and optimize your chances of success. And in the end, that it's, it's all about this, this why, don't forget this sentence of he who has a why will find the what. Okay, so even though enjoy the ride, I hope it was useful. I hope you become eventually successful entrepreneurs and probably with as much motivation, I hope that if you already have an image of entrepreneurship and you decide not to become entrepreneurs because that's not your thing and I helped to avoid a life mistake, that it's also as rewarding as uh, creating or helping a uh, potentially successful entrepreneur. So thank you so much and I lead you. Yeah, so uh, at this point we'll close this meeting. Um, thank you very much for attending these 10 sessions. Uh, as I previously said, if you haven't watched them, watch them all again. You can always watch them and replay them as many times as you need. And they're in YouTube for life. 
Um, thank you much, very much, Salvador, for all thank the you. sessions. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I've only been to two, but they were really interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And in the next few days, we'll send you a link with the video and uh, the slides, uh, so you can download them. Uh, thank you very much, and good afternoon. Bye.